Hi, everyone. Welcome to HP Connects. Today, we have a conversation with Jen Goldstone. Of uh, She's the owner and president of Garden Streets. Um, I also want to say a special thanks to our sponsor for today's webinar, Deco Inc. For, um, Deco provides specialized construction, uh, maintenance and fabrication, and services to leading biopharmaceutical, technology, and industrial clients throughout New England. And you can visit them at decco.com. So I just want to say special thanks. And Jen, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Um, I think I'm going to give it over to you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen. Um, I am the owner and president of Garden Streets. Our mission, so I'm just starting to, can you see my screen here? Absolutely. Okay, great. Our mission is to connect people with nature. Um, I myself have been a gardener for almost 30 years, so a very long time, all along the northeast corridor here. And as a professional, my career has taken many different directions. And in 2018, I decided to really follow this serious hobby of mine and make it into something um, sustainable. And um, so we started in residential design, garden design. And in 2019, one of our designs won Mayer's Small Garden Award, which was very exciting. And our core business has been in commercial real estate where we help offices and buildings bring beautiful plants inside because it has so much benefits, which we'll talk about later today. And now that a lot of us have transitioned to working from home, this conversation is about how do we translate what happens in the workspace, which is much bigger square footage, much bigger, taller ceilings, and how do we translate that into our own home environment so that you can continue to experience the benefits that we know and have been researched to be the case. So what you can expect here is lots of beautiful pictures. Uh, hopefully at the end of this, you'll be inspired and have some tools to go and do something um, additionally positive for yourself. So I'm going to move forward to the next slide here. I'm really excited about this, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So first, I'm going to talk about what biophilia is, and then the top factors, and there are more factors than the seven that I'm going to talk about here, but these are the, the top factors, I think, that we can actionably incorporate. And then we're going to look at some examples of what we can do. And just real quick at the end, plant ownership 101. And while we're starting this, I want you to take advantage of the Q&A functionality here and just put in your burning questions, like what brought you here today that you're hoping to get answered, and we're going to try to hit on those as much as possible. Okay, great. So biophilia is actually our humankind's innate connection with nature. It's already in us, and it's a love of life and the living world. It's what makes people want to have pets, it's what makes us talk to our pets and our plants, and it's what makes people want to go out camping. Um, it's part of our, I guess, when we evolved, um, our bodies are really attuned to our environment, and biophilia is what that's about. And biophilic design is about using those principles and different pieces of it and isolating it so that we translate it and bring it into the built environment so that we can have those um, benefits without being in a forest or wherever we, we can have that impact. So an example here is a hotel one. It's a hotel one in Brooklyn, New York. You can see a lot of natural materials being used and a lot of natural lighting as well as live greenery. So those are some the key aspects we're going to drill down into. But top benefits is that it reduces stress, enhances productivity. There's been research done that you can get up to 15% improvement on productivity and creativity. It helps people have fewer, um, we recover faster, so you stay in the hospital for fewer days. And even in retail environments, people are willing to spend more when they're in an environment that's more biophilic, biophilic, uh, biophilically designed. And that is real return on investment, both on our attention and our resources. Okay, 
So I picked a camping picture here because it really hits a lot of these different factors. And at the end of the day, you know, if you take away all these words, it's just about how our body is tuned with nature and how it's already connected to it. So at the end of the day, it comes down to what makes us feel safe and well. Um, and that puts us into a state of mind where we can be our best selves. So the number one piece is visual connection. And you can see I have a bunch of plants here. This is not a background. <laughs> uh, visual connection is that view to nature and pieces of nature. So here it could be trees, it could be plants, it could be an animal, any part of nature that's naturally occurring. So that's the, the visual connection. Windows are great for that, I'll say. But if not, you can bring something else inside that encompasses that. Lighting. Um, we are we have our circadian rhythm very much tuned to the beginning and the end of the days. So with natural lighting, it really helps with setting our own rhythm and knowing what to do. Non-visual pieces has to do with the sound, with the smell, the touch, just all our senses that is actually working without us even thinking about it. That's the non-visual connection to biophilia. So when you think about, let's say that you're going on a walk outside, sounds of birds, you have the breeze feel on your skin, um, you walk by a bush and you just touch it as you go by. And on a day right after a rain or even in the morning when you go outside, you can feel the humidity. So our bodies kind of processes all that without us really thinking about it or pinpointing those specific aspects. And it tells us that yes, we're in a healthy ecosystem, we're in a safe place, and thus we're gonna lower our heart rates and feel good. Um, so that's actually something that is so innate that the more you do it, the better that impact is on your body. And you don't ever develop any kind of resistance to it. So you can't have too much of biophilic design, which is really nice to hear. The fourth piece is around airflow. So this one, you know, you're out walking, there's a gentle breeze, that's great. There are times where you're in a stuffy hot room or elevator before, um, and you'll feel that it's a different scent. The presence of water is super important because we absolutely need water to survive and do well. And so we're in tune to being close to water and when we're closer to it, um, we feel safer in that we have access to a critical resource. So this means view of water, this means sound of water, maybe even the smell as well. And if you can't have those elements, you can also, we can talk about different ways that you can bring that in in an artificial way that actually has you trick your body into thinking that water is nearby. Refuge. This is protected from behind and overhead. Um, I guess in our caveman days, this means that we're in a cave, but it really means that we feel more secure and that we're more in control of our environment. So when you're setting up your desk, for example, it's actually better to have your back towards the wall so that you can see the entrance. Uh, not to say that there's any threat walking in, but that's kind of innately how we process our environment, um, both from behind and overhead. That's where most, I guess, if you're out in the nature, threats can come from. And the last piece is natural materials, minimally processed. Um, this means views of wood grains, um, rocks, sand, any pieces that you might see in nature that is natural out there is a reminder of the environment that we're so in tune to. So those are all different things that we can include in our environment in order to have that benefit just innately processed by our body. Okay. How are we doing on questions? Do we have any questions? We're gonna take a quick break because this is a this is a big list and we're gonna jump into more practical um, views of this. It doesn't look like, but I was actually curious, I was waiting uh, for a moment. You know, um, sometimes, um, you know, the, the idea of the sounds of nature is really interesting to me. I know that there are apps on your phone where you can play sounds of nature. Do you ever suggest that people do that at their home offices if they're not able to, maybe if they work in uh, a smaller room in their house that uh, 
you know, I don't know if, if they can't open the window because it's in the winter. Do, do you ever, uh, is that silly? Yeah. Yeah. No, not at all. Actually on YouTube, you can find, um, hour, two hour long videos of people walking in nature and there's just sounds that are being piped in. And there are also videos, not really moving images, but just really soundtracks of nature. It could be rain, it could be you know rainforest with the birds and the monkeys, you know, whichever you're most comfortable with. And we have experiences through our life and our travels where in particular times in that particular environment, you associate it with an experience. So if you're really relaxed by the beach, you know, the beach sounds, crashing waves, right. really like camping, so then really the birds, the owls, you know, hooting at night, right? There, we, we've done that really. Um, it helps people go to sleep as well. Like rain is one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so great question. Yeah. I think we have an additional question. Um, it says, Lauren says, how aware do you feel property owners and corporations are of are they aware of biophilia or is it a concept that architects and designers need to introduce and push? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I feel like innately people understand it, but in order to articulate it and also to convince people that it is a worthwhile investment, because a lot of times people see um, plants or things that may, they may put it in the category of extra expense or nice to have, and we've seen enough research now to say that that it has real return on investment but how do you actually measure that and can you prove it becomes a difficult conversation um so as far as property managers and businesses go oftentimes they want to be convinced with really hard data to say well if i add these five plants in my lobby i'm going to get you know x percent increase in my sales or whatnot and that's truly very difficult to measure because we live in such a complex world um and, and no two companies are exactly the same either. So from a comparison and A-B testing standpoint, it's hard to set that experiment up to say, this company has it and that one does, doesn't have it and does, that's what makes a difference because everything else is also different. Um, but I do think that the architects and designers have a very important role to also share this information and Garden Streets as a company partners with folks in the industry to come in with additional data and so on, to be that third person in the room, if you will, to say, yes, this is, this is what we've seen. Um, and we're always actually looking for really interesting experiments that we can run where the environment, call centers, for example, where the environment is much more controlled. So you can say this floor versus that floor, we'll do plants on one and not plants on the other, and assuming all other factors are as, similar as they can possibly be, we can do some of those measurements. Um, but again, those opportunities are have to come by. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. All right, so let's talk about biophilia at home. This is um, a beautiful working space. And since we just talked about the different elements, I thought it would be helpful to just, almost like a case study, you know, look at some photos, we're gonna talk through them and just point out the different elements that are being incorporated so that you can take those pieces as much as they can be applicable to your own space. Um, so here I'll say to just start with, her desk is a natural wood grain, very minimally processed. You can see even the planking of the wood, the knots in the trees when it was growing. That's very cool. Lots of plants, obviously. And she's got natural light coming in. Not sure if that window opens or not, it does, that also provides airflow so gentle breeze when you can and sounds of outside so those are all really great things and if somehow her window does not open things that you can do to bring that air movement that air flow you can do a small oscillating fan for example um, or if you have overhead fan that's also really good just something that's not super consistent you just have the fan pointing at one way then eventually we almost we don't feel that movement anymore but, but if it moves around then you'll you'll have that impact and a little goes a long way so this is a corner um, of an apartment in the city somewhere high up lots of light and that window will open a little bit but not a ton right and something that i want to point out here that we haven't talked about is the symbolic reference which is what we call also natural and not and, and not 
analogs, natural analogs, as in that when you view something, it reminds you of something in nature. So here I look at that ottoman and, you know, it could be seaweed, it could be um, really cool, just, you know, it, it looks very organic and there's your imagination, it gets your brain thinking about this. It's not like a super easy, simple cue where you look at it and you just kind of move on, your attention moves on. So um, here they also have a plant that's hung high up. That actually does something for that refuge from the overhead protection standpoint. So both, it's actually serving both purposes of having that visual connection to nature because it's a live plant, as well as giving you that overhead refuge protection. The floor here is what's natural wood grain. So you can have elements in various pieces and that all can work together. Somebody missing something right here? No. Okay. On. And here's another desk that we can look at. So here the entire desk is made out of wood grain and the image of water is a representation of that presence of water, right? So you can have photography, you can have beautiful art um, that reminds you of that. It does not have to be actual water. And here you can kind of see the natural lighting is coming from the right. So there is natural lighting, which is very nice. Um, there's a plant that's being hung, so that gives you the overhead refuge. It doesn't have to be a plant that's being hung. We'll see later. You can have lighting, like very cool chandeliers and so on. So different pieces can serve multiple purposes. So if you have a plant, let's say, in a natural container, a wooden container or ceramic or something that's minimal in process, that can serve multiple purposes as well. Or if you have a fish tank, that's water. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. All right. Here is an example of a desk with refuge behind uh, and refuge overhead, but that's in the form of a very nice chandelier. Again, very organic shapes here. The globes may, you can think of bubbles, you can think of fruit. Um, so there's, it gets your imagination going. And nothing here is symmetrical or super lined up. And I think from our attention standpoint, it makes us think a little bit more and it gives it that additional creativity boost. So live plants again here and we have natural wood grain in a different stain color here. Uh, natural light is coming in from the side. In the case where you don't have a window, what do you do for lighting? There's a couple of things. Um, one is around the spectrum of the light. So what kind of light do you have? Is it fluorescent, that's kind of bluish and so on? or is it a more yellowish light? And I'll say in different cultures, actually people are attuned to different, different types of lighting. So in Asian cultures, for example, a lot of the home lighting tends to be around the bluish side. Whereas in Western culture, we tend to go with more warm, warm color tones. So it's really, I think at that point, it's up to your preferences where you feel the most comfortable. Um, it looks like we have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael says, I love natural light, but I don't like reflections on my computer screen. The obvious yeah. put my computer screen back to the window. Is there another solution? Hmm. Well, you can, there are anti-glare um, film you can get, and those are very, very easy to install for your screen. Absolutely. There are other things you can do around shading. So if you can figure out where the light is bouncing off of, you can put something strategic there that deflects it. So diffused light, that was one of the things that we mentioned too, is actually really nice. And you can do that by having plants growing in the windows or hanging or sort of a curtain. And if you have a window open with a curtain that's moving, that also gives you additional movement in that signal that you're in a healthy environment. Um, as we're talking about you know, movement of light and movement of air and movement of water, again, that's like tuned into what's important for our survival. So if you think about stagnant water versus moving water. Moving water is much more likely to be healthy to drink and safe to drink than stagnant water and air similarly too. So I think a lot of the, it's innate to, as to what, what we want to be surviving. Mm. That helps. I love the idea of putting plants, yeah, in front of your window. That way it's, it is diffused light and it uh, offsets the glare. So that's super smart. Yeah, and if it moves, then it really feels like you're working under a tree or just lying. <laughs> on a okay. meadow. 
we have another question. Do you yes. see these questions? Okay. So the first one is, uh, do non-organic materials such as wallpaper with images of flowers, plants, et cetera, qualify as an analog? Absolutely. Absolutely they do. Yes. How many inches or feet can a plant survive from a window? Ooh, okay. We will talk about that um, in the plant care piece, but I'll touch on it a little bit here, which is, it depends. <laughs> I know we hear that a lot. It depends on the plant. Um, some plants need a lot of light. Some plants don't need a lot of light. And so it's a matter of where, it's a combination of, an, it's a little negotiation actually. You're like, well, how far do I wanna be from the window? And is that realistic for a plant? And if so, what plant is it? So you can kind of go back and forth about that. And I will say in the office environment, one of the things we often um, notice that isn't talked about as much is the energy saving benefits of motion sensor lights and its effect on plants. So if you have plants in a conference room, while it's great, uh, and if people are not using that conference room that much, that lighting is gonna go down for that plant. So we oftentimes ask, well, is this motion censored? If so, what can we do to provide more consistent lighting conditions for the plant? They really, they need that. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're in a room and you don't often go in it, but and you only go in it when, uh, you only turn the lights on when you're in it, then that's just an additional factor. You can keep the lights on for the plants <laughs> or move the plants <laughs> with you when you leave. Yeah. Great okay. questions. Love it. Uh, and this is, I, I would say like find your zen. It doesn't have to be where you work. It doesn't have to be in the living room or where people think normally relaxation is happening. Uh, bathrooms are perfectly fine places. In some ways, it's one of the best places to include elements of you already have water. That's one of the big things that bathrooms um, provide. And here you have natural granite greens. You have natural lighting and refuge overhead through hanging plants and live plants. In spaces, especially offices, where the ceiling is very high, we especially recommend having taller trees, but still lower than the ceiling to include that refuge overhead, because otherwise it just feels so, such a big and open and pervading space uh, that you can bring it down to a more human level. In most home spaces, I think with our ceilings being around 11 feet or so, or eight, um that's less of an issue but still some some plants or something there is helpful um we did a small space this was about eight feet by eight feet and we had about 200 individual plants most of them were on the living walls here it's a stand standalone living wall nothing was plugged in there was no water no electricity but we manually looked after those plants this was done during a conference room, uh, during a conference, and it acted as a retreat and an escape for conference goers to go and relax. And so if you think about the different principles that were brought in here, you have overhead, we didn't have natural lighting here, um, but we had overhead lighting and we brought plants in. And you can kind of see the shadows that the plant leaves are able to cast on the wall. That's better than just consistent flat lighting. Right, that gives it some pattern on the wall that otherwise wouldn't have it. The plant next to the chair is a fern and it actually smells very fresh. So it has a strong, so when you sit down, it has, it engages your visual connection to nature through the plants. It also gives you that smell of fresh soil and fern. And you feel very protected because of the plants overhead as well as the plants around it. So from behind and above, it's a protected space. So when people sat in there and they sunk in, what we saw was when they wore their Fitbit, their heart beat, their heart rate went down from 100 and something, from all the busyness of the conference, down to 50 something. And it was very quick. Within like three minutes, five minutes, we can measure that and it's sustained. So while they were in there the entire time, they felt good. Um, we had also a noise canceling headset there that played nature sounds. So that added additionally to that environment. And you can see also the materials that we're using there, the sisal carpet, the natural green on the chair, and you have the twine balls too. So a lot of those elements and the shapes here are very organic, all rounded corners. Okay, great, another example. 
my ownership. Any questions before I dive into plants? I think the I could talk about plants all day. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, yeah no just the one that I guess it's con you said you were going to get into this part later, but how many inches or feet can a plant survive from a window? Got it. I'll well, consider that. Great. I'll, I'll consider that answered, and you'll go into it further. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So the, the overarching principle is having the right plant in the right place. Uh, and this is about how much, which way does your window face? Um, we have Northwest, Southeast, those lights or the lighting that you get from each of those directions are very different. And two hours in the morning, East morning light is not the same as two hours in the afternoon hot, you know, Western exposure light. So just being aware of where your light is, number one, because that is number one as it's because that's what plants do is light. They take light, they photosynthesis to create their own food. So plant food is a little bit of a misnomer in that you can't really feed a plant, you just have to give it light. You give it water and then it creates its own food. Um, okay, so light is interesting in the sense that it drops off exponentially the further away you get from the source because it expands out into a surface area and the density, the intensity drops off um, exponentially as well. So when you're one foot away versus two feet away, it's not half the amount, it's a quarter of the amount. So if you think about it that way, five feet away from the window, you're getting very little light from that light, uh, from that window compared to a plant that is right up by it. So just keep that in mind. Um, I would say when we're placing plants, if you're beyond five to six feet from a window, the effect of the window is really no longer that significant. And we don't take it, we don't really take that into account anymore. We start looking at what artificial light we can bring in to really be the main source for that plant. Um, okay, so watering. Watering is the number one reason why plants die is overwatering. Because when you do that, the roots kind of rot and so on. What our principle is, is sparingly and deeply. Um, and I'll talk about what that means. Deeply means that you want to get water to the entire root system as much as you can. And ideally, a little bit further. So it gets the root to go towards the water. In a potted plant, that's really not an issue because the roots are already on the edges. And what you want to do is get water to the outside as much as you can too. So really the amount of water that's applied each time is a function of the size of the pot, not so much the function of the plant. What the frequency of watering is, is then a function of what plant you have. So you always, so for two plants, one loves water and the other one does not. When you water them, you give them almost the same amount it's the frequency that you change. The one that loves water will get more frequent watering and the one that does not, does not. So when you water it deeply, you wanna water it sparingly in the sense that you don't wanna water it more frequently than you need to. And how do you know when to water? Uh, there's a number of ways. One is you can watch the plant and just observe it because that's good for you anyway. You're having that visual connection with nature. And to that end, I say as close proximity as you can place a plant and as big as you can go is, is a great way to do it. But otherwise, a little desk plant on the desk will do a lot as well because you get that face time all the time, all day long. So let's say that you're observing a plant and the leaves are either drooping or the color is changing, it's not as glossy. That's oftentimes a sign that it needs water. And different plants react to water in different ways. Ferns, for example, they may shrivel up um, and then they expand when they get that water. Certain plants will droop when they get dry and other plants may shrink actually when they get dry. Succulents, for example, cactuses, where they store water, they really have a huge range of movement in their stems as they go from very dry to very full of water. So over time, you'll understand based on the plant that you have how it reacts to water and then you can kind of either set a schedule or just if you're looking at it every day, then you can react to it as you need to. That, um, there's a couple of questions. I think you sort of touched upon the second one. One is, uh, does adding miracle Grow 
um, <laughs> plants and how many times do you water uh, a plant per week? But I guess it sounds like it, it depends. Yeah, right. It depends on your plant. Right. I would say, you know, I have not, most plants, unless it's a seedling or a tiny plant in a very hot space, don't need more than once a week. And I think once a week should be plenty for the most like regularly sized plants that are more mature. Um, so the earlier question is around, let's see, oh, miracle grow. So miracle grow, I would equate that to like an energy shot <laughs> in some ways. It, so it gives it a boost, but you kind of almost have to keep using it once you start. And it, it's usually a liquid form. If you use a liquid form, it leaches out as you water. So you want, as you're watering, it drains away, right? So it, it goes away and you have to reapply it. And once you keep doing that, and the plant is like, yeah, I get all this food, I'm, I'm bodybuilding, right? So you have to keep on doing that. Um, and the growth that comes out of miracle Grow, depending on the plant, could be a little different, right? If you're feeding it a lot, it's trying to grow a lot, and that growth may be a little bit more tender and a little more juicier than it normally would be under a slightly more uh, lean environment, if you will. And that sometimes that juicy growth is uh, very attractive for pests, I would say. And yeah, so I would just be careful with that. Other fertilizers that we use are, for example, flow release. So these come in little pellets and they're essentially coated with a material, uh, with a membrane that when you water allows the nutrients inside those, those pellets to kind of seep out slowly. And those pellets you only have to apply once every four to six months and just kind of dig it into the top of the soil, have it be covered in water as you regularly would, and it kind of applies a slow release of the nutrients. Um, depending on what you're trying to do, again, I think either of those could work. For vegetables, if you're trying to get to a faster harvest and you have lots of light, lots of water, then applying miracle Grow is a perfect fit because it's you're trying to get it to be that nice beefy plant that you can eat. Um, but for something that's more ornamentally focused or something that naturally comes from an environment of lean nutrients, you know, like succulents and alpine plants or um, a lot of native plants actually don't like a lot of fertilizer. If you fertilize it, it's like, oh, what do I do with awesome nutrients? <laughs> um, and it grows the soft growth, which then becomes very tasty for, for animals and pets. Interesting. Um, I uh, okay. The, um, one question is: What do you recommend for a complete plant rookie to start with indoor plant? Uh, yeah. Would yeah, to start with indoor plants. To start with indoor plants. So I, I would again, you know, go back to the lighting piece of it. How much light do you have at the space that you want to put your plant? Um, there's there's a lot of different options based on that. So our we recently just started an online store because we wanted to get plants to people where they are now, which is not so much in the offices, but at their home. So you can essentially order and then we ship the plants to you. Um, on there, all the plants are actually grouped by lighting conditions. So whether you have low light, bright light, very bright light or medium light, you can kind of look at all the plants that could potentially fit in that um, in terms of varieties anyway. But just to start with a couple of really common plants that are easy to look after. Um, snake plant is one, it's essentially a succulent. I should have brought my like plant models I can show you. Um, Snake plant is one, very little watering needed. It can deal with low to medium light. I would not put it in full sun or in kind of really strong sun and burn the leaves. Um, pothos is one, otherwise also known as devil's vine because it really grows anywhere and you can cut a piece off and put it in water and it'll root itself. So even if the whole thing dies and you still have that little green piece, you can regrow it and it'll come back. Um, and it kind of is eventually is a trailing kind of a vine. And I will say a lot of indoor plants that we have were never indoor to start with until people started building indoor environments, right? So if you think about what they might see in their natural habitat, that's always a good way to kind of figure out what kind of what needs they have. So take pothos that I was just talking about. It grows natively in places like Florida. And what it does is it scrambles up the side of palm trees and regular trees, and it, the leaves can get to about a foot. And when we have it at home, they're about maybe three to four inches is the size. So plants can look very different in different environments. And Jen, one of the things, yeah. 
Oh, I can I, give you more plants too. We can maybe even type it in later. Yeah, no, I was oh, typing right. in as you were saying that. One of the things I thought was really cool, um, and I encourage everybody to visit Garden Streets, is um, that you have this Q and A on mm -hmm. what plant works for uh, what kind of a person. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how you came up with that idea? Sure, sure. I mean, people are always asking me exactly that question. It's like, what plant should I get? And it's like, well, it totally depends. Like, what colors do you like? And what kind of shape do you like? And um, how, are you an overwaterer? Are you an underwaterer? And so we came up with a fun questionnaire uh, where you can take and figure out what your plant personality is. Um, we ask you questions about, you know, do you like, is your hair curly versus straight? Do you like, you know, form-fitting clothes versus more loose clothes? And do you like bright colors versus more neutral colors and do you like patterns versus you know so we, we ask you those questions and then we make recommendations um, of the plant at the end of the day on that and we we try to recommend plants that are very easy to look after anyway so all of those are um, very doable plants I feel I, love, I was pothos <laughs> yeah pothos is easy going easy going put it anywhere it'll it'll do great um, okay, temperature, the third piece. Temperature is interesting because in, inside, you know, wherever you're comfortable, your plants are going to be fine. Um, where it really comes in is when you're trying to fruit, set fruit, or have flower buds. For certain plants, they are sensitive to daytime, nighttime temperature difference. And for us in the average home, there's really not a lot of temperature change over the course of the day. So for plants that need, let's say, at least 10 degree drop in order to set those flower buds, they're just not going to do that. They'll grow leaves, they'll be happy, but they're not going to get that seasonal change that they would get in nature with that nighttime temperature drop. So knowing that um, some plants that are affected by that is uh, orchids is a big one. So you see a beautiful orchid shopping in the supermarket and you're like, I'm going to pick this up. It, the flowers last for a month or two months, great. And then they drop off, which is fine. That's natural. You cut off the, the stalk and then, and then it doesn't reflower again. You wonder why. And it's that temperature drop. So if you have a nice shaded spot, this is specific to orchids outside, I would just recommend like putting it out there and have it have that experience. And as, as, as soon as you brought it inside, it'll be able to bloom again. The fourth piece around successful plant ownership, I say, is around setting the right expectations. I think we all have high expectations, right? For performing at work, for performing our best. And when it comes to plants, it's the same too. You say, oh no, that leaf just turned yellow. It's falling, it's falling. what's going on? And you wanna fix it right then and there. And it's not really necessary. Um, and I think a lot of times we, we have those high expectations and we use terms like, Plant parenthood, and it just—it's tough. Like right when you ha when you think of yourself as a parent to a plant, it's very hard to to accept failure. But um, it is totally okay to fail as a gardener. That is how how we learn. I have killed many plants. It is totally okay. Um, so I would say just yeah, set the right expectations and just re be relaxed about it. It's here as a relaxing activity not one to add anxiety um <laughs> yeah one, one other fun statistic is that insects outnumber people 200 million to one so if you're trying to like make sure there's no no bugs ever that's going to be a tough battle to fight i think um and just if you do find pests understand what it is and then based on that have treatment and if you feel like you're losing the battle you can you can get a new plant. It's okay. <laughs> I give you permission. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, where do you get the flow release product that you were referring to? Which the I slow release? Yeah. Slow release, rather. Yep. Slow release. Uh, and so if, right. Now, I mean, your local nursery should have it if they're open. But if, um, if not, you can also go online and search for slow release. Um, fertilizer granules and that's kind of and I can also post later as to the specific brands that that we have had success with there's a number of suppliers out there uh when do you recommend the season to plant outside so Ooh, that depends on what you're trying to plant <laughs> <laughs> so um there's a number of plants that you can put out now that are cool season so for flowering 
plants, you have probably already seen tulips, um, daffodils, they're already out and blooming. For a lot of plants like that, you want to plant the season before. So those bulbs that, you're, that are so beautiful coming up now were planted in the fall. So, but you can, you can buy them now and plant them. It's just much, I think it's more expensive to buy them in bloom than to buy them in a box of bulbs. Um, so that's one example. For edibles, if that's what you're looking at, peas are great, lettuce, uh, spinach, you have some early, early um, radishes also, you can plant those, they're very fast germinating plants. And I would say especially for indoors, if you're going to the supermarket and you have a stump of a lettuce left over, just set it in a cup of water, have the bottom be touching the water, it'll actually root and you can, you can see the growth coming out of it. Put it in a bright window, always have light for your plants. Similarly for spring onions, you can, you, know, you can see them having their roots cut off before, before you can purchase them. So just stick them in water and they'll regrow for you and you can always uh, continue to harvest from the top and have fresh greens. Um, quite a few herbs that stay small are good for indoor use. Mint, for example, is another one. You can even just stick mint in water and it'll grow. I will caution, however, if you don't put it outside or if you do put it, constrain the roots in another pot so that it doesn't escape and take over. It, it, it will do that. Um, warmer weather, I would say more in June, July time period. Tomatoes, um, eggplant, those are more warm weather plants. If you're looking to do things like perennials, which are plants that come back year after year, or shrubs or trees, the best time to plant those are actually the fall time. Second best time is early spring. Um, in the, just because it gives the roots more time to establish before they have to deal with the stress of a hot and dry summer. Um, but it's not impossible. You can plant, uh, you can plant them at those times. You just have to give it extra TLC. Okay, maximize space time. Yep, go ahead. There's another question. Oh no, I was just saying thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, the last piece here, maximize space time with nature to maximize impact. So there was research that showed that a lot of the benefits that we've talked about, you only need five minutes of exposure in order to get a lot of that. So you get that initial boost in that five minutes and then it kind of continues on a little bit um, further. But if you are you know, on the go and you're like, I need my nature fix, you just need five minutes. Um, look at something green, it, go outside for five minutes, um, that will do it. Um, and the other piece to remember is it really does not wear off. So you can do this multiple times during the day. You set an alarm for yourself every hour, take that five minute nature break. Um, that's different from going to the bathroom, but you know, this is what I mean by a nature break, looking at nature, interacting with nature and being outside. Um, yeah, this, I mentioned be ruthless. This is what I was referring to about, you know, if a plant isn't performing for you because it was the right, the wrong fit, if it came with bugs or it, if it somehow just isn't doing what it could be doing, it's okay to toss it and do something else. If it has bugs, I don't recommend trying to recycle it and similarly get rid of the pot as well unless you can sanitize that so things don't come back. Be ruthless, but hopeful you can do it. There's no such thing, I think, as a black thumb. You just need to find the right plant for your right thing. Okay, so now that we have learned all this good stuff, I would say sharing is caring. Uh, there's research around specifically what a small desk plant can do. This was done in, I think, in Japan. They had multiple people and they did A-B testing with measuring their anxiety levels. And they, what they found was that after only three minutes of viewing, there was measurable difference. So if you had something on your desk and you're spending hours and hours on Zoom calls on your computer, looking over and then looking back, and looking over again, you can have that very easy way to access these benefits that is innate to your body um, that can help you in lots of other things too. So we ship plants. Uh, we can also ship it with a custom message with your logo along with instructions. Something else that we also do is in addition to helping with, I mean, with what you could be doing, we send plant care reminders that's customized to your particular plant. So either via text or email. Um, so you don't have to forget when to water. And I'll say one thing around that. Um, for some of the plants that we send reminders for, the interval is long. It's longer than what the plant owner 
they expect it. So they say, well, am I supposed to do something now? Because it's been a week. I'm like, yes, it's okay. You're not supposed to water it for another two weeks um, in your environment. So just chill. It's all good. Okay. Another question. Yes. I love it, actually. This is actually, I have a cat as well. Can you recommend the best cat proof plants? <laughs> well, I will say cat is much higher on the food chain than plants. They can destroy anything they want. Uh, but there are some plants that are safe for cats to eat and interact with. Um, for one, so ferns, a lot of ferns are okay for, for cats as well as palm. So if you look for cat palm, literally, that is the common name for it, cat palm has a much longer scientific name that we'll bore you with. Um, so that one is good. You've all heard of cat mint. That's a plant that cats will love. Um, spider plant actually is a plant that's quite good for plants to, uh, for cats as well. They're safe um, for them to nibble on. The plants itself will send out these shoots and it's a very water loving plant. So essentially in nature, it sends out these shoots in search of more water uh, and if you leave them, they grow these little plantlets and they hang from the main pot like a little chandelier. So cats love to just like bat at it and so on. I've seen that happen too. And that's and they can actually, if they eat the leaves, it's not poisonous for them. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, there are quite a few plants that are not great for for cats, but you know, don't get those. <laughs> yeah, fabulous. Jen, this is great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to send what each of my employees like a little a little um, plant. Yeah, for your clients too. Good. And my clients. <laughs> Everybody, send the clients. It's clients wellness is it's literally a caring. It's it's something that lasts quite a while and yeah. that will keep reminding them of you. Good. I would uh, say uh, there there's a list of references and resources if people wanted to get to dig into this. There's quite a lot of really good research papers and so on. Um, so the last page has a little bit more resources and I'm available as well if you wanted to reach out. We have another question. Mm -hmm. Joe asks, what is the most popular plant you find people uh, give as gifts? Oh gosh. I think it depends on the season. I think it really depends on who you're giving. You know, for Mother's Day, really popular anthurium is a flowering plant um has flower has the flower itself is actually very small but the colors that we see as a flower um are actual leaves so it lasts for a month at a time so that's a really good gift plant um how do you spell it anthurium anthurium mm -hmm. I'll put that like an auditorium but an anthurium <laughs> okay okay <laughs> uh other plants you know i think people generally give things that are you know that are colorful so orchids are popular but then again you know do they have the right environment and are they going to get fat if it doesn't bloom without that temperature drop so there's some knowledge and i think a lot of times the um some of the failures we've had with plants comes from a well-wishing plant that just isn't the right fit for our space you know like cactus and succulents in the recent media has gotten a lot of good attention because they photograph so well and they're gorgeous and you get those pink orange red colors with on the edges they only get that color when they get a ton of light and that's the response that the plant has um what we call sun stress is what it does when it gets stressed by the sun so when you put it in a place that's not as bright or if you've watered it too much that overwatering, that lack of light is is a very quick death sentence for for those plants um and they are very popular as gift plants because they're so sturdy they're easy to ship and they last a long time on the shelves. So you can see that the supply chain loves them as well, but we just have to be aware of uh, the reasons why they've become popular. So I would, that, that would be part of my answer. There's probably more we can talk about. This, this was great. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, <laughs> I almost forgot, <laughs> odd man out, sir. <laughs> I almost got away with it. I was trying to stay quiet. No, <laughs> all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna name, um, a few some very obvious uh things that have to do with biophilia and okay. you are going to name the odd man I better get it right <laughs> otherwise <laughs> all right what makes uh, a healthy office is it natural uh what is the odd man out in in this list that makes a healthy office natural light indoor plants views of the sea your husband's laundry <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm okay. going to go with D, your husband's laundry. <laughs> oh, that's correct. How did you get that? Uh, thank you again uh, to Jen at Garden Streets for coming on and sharing her knowledge. Uh, special thanks to Deco for being our sponsor today. Uh, Deco provides specialized construction, maintenance, and fabrication services to lead, leading biopharmaceutical technology and industrial clients throughout New England. You can visit them at decco.com.